I was here I, first time at the ILE about 20 some years ago. It was a bankruptcy conference, Michael, and you were, I don't know who the speaker was, but you were, you were emceeing, and there wasn't a whole lot I remember about the bankruptcy topics we talked about other than at one point, Alan Schwartz from Yale said, I would like to quote from my favorite author, me. <laughs> and it, you heard a collective groan go up in the room. Like, you really didn't say that, did you? The, you will not hear me quote from me today, thank goodness. But I will be quoting from someone whom I admire greatly and whose writing has affected the way I think, and that's Richard Posner, Dick Posner, formerly of the Seventh Circuit, who was the speaker here on October 11th of 2006. And I remember when I came up to that, it was standing room only, and, and there should be uh, for Dick. He was, he was and is one of the great intellects of our time. I, when I first became a judge, I thought, okay, I got this down. I know, I know what to do. And we'll, people will argue cases, and I'll look at this, and we'll figure it out, and I'll have law clerks helping me. And I didn't get it. And it hit me that people are arguing, this case supports me and doesn't support my opponent, and the opponent says, no, I can distinguish that case. Something else supports me. And neither one of the cases that they're really primarily relying on truly helps them. And so I'm thinking, what in the world can I do to try to get a handle on exactly how it is or what I should do to think best in trying to do my craft? And I'll start off with Dick Posner, who wrote in 2008, How Judges Think. And in that, he gave nine theories for how judges go about doing the process of deciding. The first theory was the, what he calls the attitudinal theory that judges make decisions based on their small p political preferences, not necessarily partisan sometimes, but not necessarily, most of the time not. But that's the primary impetus for how they decide. The second theory that Dick noted was the strategic theory, because i The strategic theory. How many times I would have, like, Norm Vesey say to me at the firm, just find me a case. No, it was actually not Norm Vesey. It was Marty Lubroff used to say that to me. Just find me a case. Well, what do you want the case on, Marty? Just find me a case on this. I don't care how you do it. Get me to a result. It's conclusion or goal-oriented, and somebody just wants you to get there. And you see a lot of that going on today in our political discussions where we all, we, people work from conclusions and then try to fit everything into that. The third theory, and one that I think has a great deal of credence, is the sociological theory. And that is that judges, appellate judges, on panels make decisions based on to some extent, the, who the panelists are, if they're your friends and you are relatively risk-averse or dissent-averse, you try to work something out. So on our court, somebody may say, I don't like where you're going. That's a problem for me. But I'll tell you what, if you make this a not presidential opinion, I'll go along. Why? Because I live to fight another day is what the person's thinking, and we'll go from there. Who knows? There are various reasons. And when you get these groups, oftentimes the one with not, a, not necessarily the strongest personality, but the one who has that ability to get others to agree. Great example, William Brennan. 
his clerks used to say to him oftentimes, how can you possibly agree to that? And he would go, and they go, what's that? He'd go, get me to five. I can't get there without this kind of compromise. And that is how oftentimes you get to a consensus. And studies have shown, as I've, as I've said, that this does make a difference. The fourth theory, and I will juxtapose this with the eighth theory. The fourth theory is called the psychological theory, and the eighth is called the phenomenological theory. The fourth is that you make decisions based on your experiences from your prior life. And the eighth theory is that what's your blink response when somebody says something to you? How does it feel? Well, quite often how you feel is based on your prior experiences as a human. And so I, I think they really dovetail. The fifth theory is what he calls the economic theory. I'm not quite sure why, because what he was focusing on for judges is what are those decisions that will give me prestige, that will give me respect, that will make my name known. And the quintessential example of that, by his own admission, was Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. He wrote numerous letters in his late 60s, early 70s. I just want to be great. I just want to do something that leaves that imprint on the law that says that I did it. I changed the scene. And they will know me for that. And what happened in his case, he was lamenting when he was even 75 years old, he had done nothing great to be remembered for. Yes, he had been shot four times in the Civil War, usually a die after the first time, uh, from infection, he didn't. Uh, the second time he was shot at Antietam, it went through his neck and just missed a uh, artery. Shot in 1864 in the leg, that thought that was the least severe of the ones he had, and it turns out he almost lost his leg. And he had given some famous speeches on to war veterans groups in 1884 and 1894. He was a justice on the Massachusetts Supreme Court. He had written the treatise on the history of the common law, which is, I would say, except for one sentence, forgettable. Maybe some of you remember the line in uh, there, the history of the law is not logic, the history of law is experience. That's about it. I wouldn't recommend the rest of the book. <laughs> but, and then he was on the Supreme Court. There were some professors, led initially by Felix Frankfurter, whom Holmes had met in 20 or 1912, introduced him to others, including a professor at Harvard, Zechariah Chaffee, Jr., and also a, an, a, uh, an academic, not a lawyer, but an academic but named Harold Lasky, and also a chance meeting in 1918 between Holmes and a district judge by the name of Learned Hand. And those four basically were saying to him, yes, you have done a lot of decisions that on the First Amendment are pretty tough. A case called Patterson v. Colorado in 07 where he wrote for the court saying that if you put a cartoon in uh, that criticized and an article that criticized the Colorado Supreme Court, you could be prosecuted because you commented on a pending case and therefore you could be prosecuted for attempting to interfere with a pending, uh, pending litigation. The Supreme Court upheld it. A case called Fox v. Washington in 20, or 1915, I keep thinking 2015, 1915, in which in Tacoma there was a group of homeites that were anarchists and they would believed in sunbathing in the nude, and there was an ordinance passed that they couldn't do that, and somebody wrote saying that whoever it tries to enforce that ordinance should be boycotted. That person was prosecuted, and the decision was, I believe, either nine to zero or seven to two, Holmes wrote the decision saying it's okay, because the First Amendment was viewed 
that you can pa have laws out there that tend to curb, quote, bad tendencies. So this is 2015. The man is now mid-70s. They then said, to, you know what, you, you could make a difference here. And in a case where he was in the majority, but in March of 1919, had espoused a different test. And it was the clear and present danger test, which we you know, can't yell fire in a theater and cause a panic. Still was with the majority, but eight months later, he dissented. And he had written beautiful words that many, many men of fighting face believe things differently and let the marketplace decide, in effect. It was a libertarian point of view, very, very different from where he had been just a few years earlier. And that traced out over the years so that by 1969 in Brandenburg, Ohio, you had that libertarian point of view with respect to the First Amendment. Let the marketplace decide. That was his great achievement. And others, by flattering him, had got him to that point where this could make me great. That's the fifth theory. Sixth theory, the organizational theory, that you do things based on the culture of your court. Maybe you're dissent averse. Maybe you have a lot of dissents. Who knows what it might be? And I've mentioned to others that the quintessential example, which is quite far out, Steve Breyer had in the 90s, former USSR judges. And they were asking him how he decided. And he was, actually, it might have been around the, around the time you were there, close to it. And he was, he was going on, and he can talk for a while. And he noticed some, a, a bit of, not laughter, but little tittering. And he finally said, OK, how do you decide? And somebody said, we have telephone justice. Telephone justice? He said, yeah, if it's a big issue, somebody in the Kremlin calls us on the telephone and tells us what to do. <laughs> That's the far out example of the uh, organizational theory. The seventh theory is the one that Posner espouses the most, the one that most he believes should be the, the way judges go in terms of where you, what you put on the front burner. And that's the, the pragmatist theory. What are the consequences of what I am doing? How will this affect the next case? Above all, be practical and use your common sense. I mentioned the eighth theory, the phenomenological theory. The ninth theory is the one that Posner disdains the most. He calls it the legalist theory. That all I do is decide cases based on a canonical listing of important decisions. And the syllogism is that the law supplies the primary principle, the facts supply the secondary principle, and the conclusion is your result. And they just hide behind that. I just, I just, follow, the, just follow the law. The rule of law is everything, I just follow it. Or as Posner has said, when Chief Judge Roberts was having his confirmation hearing in 2005, I just call balls and strikes. And he's going, call balls and strikes? You've got to be kidding me. That dude makes the strike zone. And it seems funny, if all you're doing is calling balls and strikes, how different people's strike zones are. Now, of course, that's also true for major umpires. So <laughs> you're, allowed to, you're allowed to do that. My problem with what, and if you're an advocate, for example, to the students here, and you're trying to get a judge to decide, well, that's a look back. What if you have to look forward in trying to get a judge on your side, or at least maybe a judge who is reticent to join where you are advocating, for how to get that judge to maybe think about it. And so I have said to Dick Posner, I said, you know, it's wonderful to look back, but I don't know if it's good looking forward. My most influential work that I have known about 
I can't say I've read it, I've heard about it. It was at a symposium at NYU Law School for Appellate Judges in July of 2001. And it was a five-day symposium, starts on Sunday, finishes on Friday, Sunday night. And the Solicitor General was to have been there on Sunday night and was to have spoken. He could not be there. And so what happened was that Sam Leistreicher, who was the co-coordinator of the symposium, had to get up and put something together for this dinner. And what he said was, I have just read an article. Unfortunately, he can't find his notes. I can't find my notes. Neither one of us can remember who the author was. But he said, I've just read this article, and it talks about the current members on the Supreme Court and says that when you read the newspaper, it will say that the liberals did this and the conservatives did that. And he said, don't think of it that way. Think of the currently existing Supreme Court as four and a half camps of thinking. And the first camp was, as you can imagine, the textualist camp. Look at the text of a statute or a regulation. Do not look at the legislative history because they would say pejoratively that the legislative history is written by a staffer for a boss. It's not written for a committee and certainly is not written for the full Congress. And interestingly enough, uh, and, uh, and clearly into that category, the author placed Justices Scalia and Thomas. And without a doubt, Justice Scalia has made a difference in how people approach cases. Don Verrilli, the former Solicitor General, said back in the 70s, his office, when he was arguing cases, he wasn't Solicitor General at the time, they would start with legislative history. And I found out, wow, and, and then fill in the law, and yet there's a, there's a case called Volpe, V-O-L-P-E, from 1971, in which it dealt with the Highway Transportation Act, and it said, the legislative history of the Highway Transportation Act is ambiguous. Therefore, we have to look at the statute. I mean, life has changed so dramatically. But it goes from one end of the spectrum to the other. To me, the chief judge of the Second Circuit, Bob Katzman, has written a small book called Judging Statutes. And he had worked on the Hill, and it resonated with me because I had previously worked on the Hill as well. We took our jobs very seriously. And we weren't just writing for a boss. We were listening to a whole committee. We were talking with other committee members on both sides of the aisle. I'm not sure that's done today. But the idea was, let's put down in writing what this committee wants to say. And you are especially careful if you're doing it with a conference committee. So the House and the Senate have passed a bill, and you have to have a conference to reconcile the differences in the bills, and boy, you better get it right. So there are gradations of legislative history, what we call legislative history. So a conference committee report, a committee report, the moving members on the floor, what they have to say because they participated in the drafting, and then yeah, if it's, if it's a stray comment from somebody who's not on the committee on the floor of the Senate or the House, you can discount it. But be careful. If I write Jean, or Jean writes me a letter, and I say to her, Jean, what did you mean by that? And you tell me, this was the purpose in writing the letter. It's not that different with Congress. This is our purpose in writing this statute. Why not at least give it some credence? And so the, the Katzman view is in the middle. And it's certainly the one that I think it has its place. The second camp of this author was what he called, I believe it was a male, the structuralist camp. And that is you look to the structure of federal state relations. Back in, up until the mid to late 30s, the states predominated. And there wasn't much use of the Commerce Clause in order to enact federal statutes. About 37, when the Supreme Court began to change over, 
things changed so that within a course of four to five years, by the time you got the Wickard v. Filburn, you had the high water mark of allowing the Commerce Clause to be used. In other words, Commerce Clause, can you, you can regulate something if it goes across state lines. Maybe some of you remember Wickard v. Filburn. That was like this farmer in Ohio who was paid not to grow crops or to grow only a certain amount. And so, it's okay, I'm not going to sell them. And he had, he grew wheat and he used the wheat to feed his chickens and his cattle. And he was over the amount of wheat that he was supposedly to have grown and the government came after him and said, you lose your subsidy, you've violated the statute. And he said, no, no, I didn't do anything across state lines. How can you possibly say that? Goes to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, I think it was nine to nothing, said, if you had not grown that wheat and fed it to your chickens and your cattle, you would have had to go elsewhere to get it. And therefore, it affects interstate commerce. And therefore, it's constitutional. That case has been parked in a corner somewhere. It's never been overruled. But that was the high water mark. And it continued like that. Where you saw it most was in your criminal statutes. I believe, I haven't gone back and, and double-checked this, that it, over 60% of our criminal statutes in America, and I think about 45, 4,600 total, have been adopted since 1960, all by the use of the Commerce Clause. So at some point, you would think there's going to be pushback, and indeed there was. In 1995, in the Lopez case, you had guns within 1,200 feet of a school People saying that's, that's local. Federal government stay out of that. And so that was a 5-4 decision. That decision, and you can see the lead up to it, affected then Senator Biden, who wanted to make sure that people understood that his, his baby was the Crime Act of 1994, which included the Violence Against Women's Act. And there was a lot of work done by staff to show that this affects across state lines. But nonetheless, in Morrison in 2000, Supreme Court split five to four, and they said, now it's primarily a domestic relations issue, and government stay out of it. Affordable Care Act in 2012. You've got Paul Clement saying, you can't force me to eat broccoli. And you go, what? You can't force me to buy health insurance. You can regulate commerce that's in play. You can't force me to get off of my couch and become active in commerce. And the Supreme Court, five to four, said that's correct. A good friend of mine who had argued, she had argued 32 cases before the Supreme Court said, you know, if I was on the other side of that case, Here's what I would have said. Health care. One sixth of the American economy, a six lane, not highway, super highway, would have been her theme. You've got doctors, you've got patients, you've got hospitals, you've got insurance companies, you've got pharmaceutical companies, and you have medical device makers. If that isn't interstate commerce, nothing in America is, literally nothing. That would have been her theme. Didn't, didn't get a chance to make it, she didn't argue the case. But so be it. The, that structure. The third camp is the one the author calls the consequentialist camp. This is the seventh theory of Dick Posner. Look at the consequences of what you're doing. By the way, in the second camp, the author placed Justices Breyer and Souter, which made no sense to me, but so be it. Third camp was look to the consequences of what you're doing, how, what is the practical effect, and how will it affect the next case down the road. <clears throat> Don't be so broad that somebody will come back at you later on and say, hey, Ambro, you just decided this, so you therefore have to decide in my favor because look at all the language you used. And into that camp, 
I think quite rightly, the author placed Justice O'Connor and Justice Kennedy, certainly Justice O'Connor, without a doubt. And the final camp is the one that we have, every single one of us have understood in this room since we were two or three years old. It's the fairness camp. My sister got something that I didn't get, and damn it, that's just not fair. And of course, what's the quintessential case on that? It's, it's Brown v. Board of Education. When you go back and read Brown, which is remarkably short, and contrary to what Robert Jackson wanted to do when he was talking with the Chief Justice Earl Warren, wanted him to use language that would resonate over the ages. And Warren said, no, this, is, this has got to be simple and direct and non-accusatory in order to get the full court to join in, to make a nine to nothing decision, and for everybody in America to understand. And he said to his law clerk at the time, when you're writing this up, just note in there that this is simple justice. Simple justice did not make it into the opinion, but it did become the title of the seminal work on Brown v. Board of Education, which was Richard Kluger's book in 1975-76 called Simple Justice, of all the cases that went up before uh, the Supreme Court. And Jack and Cynthia Norm and we're all proud to be Delawareans because the only case, cases that were affirmed in Brown v. Board of Education were the two from Delaware that were written by Colin Seitz, Belton and Beulah. And can't say enough. Thurgood Marshall had said that that was our first great victory on the road to integration. And William Rehnquist later said it was the greatest decision in Delaware's history. That's the fairness camp. And into that camp, the author placed Justices Ginsburg and Stevens. He left out Chief Justice Rehnquist saying that he borrowed from all four camps to get where he wanted. Perhaps that would be the strategic theory of, of Dick Posner. Who knows? So how might that play out in a case? And the author, or it was a Sam Eistrick, I think it was the author, had said, take a look at a case in sentencing in 2000 called Apprendi. Apprendi was a case where a person pled guilty, that is, I am guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, to two sets of crimes in New Jersey. One could get three to five years. The second set, I believe, could get five to ten years. But you could not go beyond ten years. And the person pled guilty. But New Jersey also had a hate crime statute, which said that if you are convicted of a crime, hate crime that a judge finds at sentencing, which in effect means by a preponderance of the evidence, that that judge can add up to two years onto the maximum sentence. So in this case, the person didn't get 10 years, he got 12. Goes to the Supreme Court. And the court split five to four in finding that this was unconstitutional. The primary opinion, well, in the majority, you had Justice Stevens, Scalia, Thomas, Ginsburg, and Souter. And in the dissent, you had Justice O'Connor, Breyer, and Rehnquist and Kennedy. Stevens wrote, and he actually used the words, this is simple justice. We should not do this. Justice Scalia, followed by a much longer opinion supplementing his concurrence by Justice Thomas, essentially said, this is not the way that we understood the Sixth Amendment when it was ratified by the states in 1791 that if you are to be found guilty of a critical element in a crime, you must be found guilty by a jury of your peers and, in effect, beyond a reasonable doubt. Different ways of getting to the same result, but from different perspectives. The dissent, primary dissent, was written by Justice O'Connor, in which she said, the consequences of this case is that it will open the floodgates to almost every prisoner in America wanting to be resentenced because something was wrong. And she went so far as to say to our then Chief Judge Becker on our court, 
that in her then 18 years on the Supreme Court, it was the decision that she most lamented seeing. I don't think, it, we, yes, there were a lot of cases, but it all worked out from Apprendi through Booker, et cetera. But she was looking at the consequences. So for those of you who will be litigating, yes, the cases are important and you've got to be able to deal with them because other people are going to put them before you. But what about the themes? Every really good Supreme Court practitioner that I know goes up to the court with no more than two, maybe sometimes three, themes. And you'll see them revert back to their themes. That's how they do it. It works. I would love to see it done more often in cases that we have. So, so often it's, I'm just arguing the, the words of the statute, which, and you get that I think even more in the federal system than anything else because the text is, is beat into you. But it would be so much nicer if somebody could give you a, some reasoning beyond cases that you know you can distinguish and go from there. I'll leave you with one comment on uh, Colin Seitz. We interviewed Collins a few months before he died in 1998. And one of the, the former partner of Norm and, my, and, and, and me, uh, Ned Carpenter, it was a three hour interview. And one of the questions was, because of his decision in Beulah and Belton, he could never go on the Delaware Supreme Court, he was blackballed. And so he went on the Third Circuit in 1966. And he was on, so the Court of Chancery from a very young age uh, when he's early 30s to 1966, 20 years. And he was on the Third Circuit for 32 years. And the question was, what did you enjoy more? Your 20 years on the Chancery Court or your 32 years on the Third Circuit? And he goes, that's easy, Court of Chancery. So with that, I invite any questions that you may have. I'd be interested in any thoughts you may have as to how those of you who are jurists or former jurists, uh, how you went about doing your craft. But to me, this is something that I think about in the forefront of my mind, in the back of my mind, and I still don't have all the answers, so maybe you can supply them. Thank you. There's a culture of the circuit. There are, I mean, we've been, I guess, lucky in that most of the people on our circuit get along quite well. There are some circuits, I won't name names here, where they don't like each other, and it affects the ability to do their job, I believe. Be the size of the circuit affects that? You know, it's funny, the Ninth Circuit is twice as big as, and it has over twice as many cases as the second biggest circuit in terms of cases. I don't detect on the Ninth Circuit they necessarily dislike each other. They just don't know each other. <laughs> they have 20, 28, 29 active judges and about 30 senior judges, 60 people, and who are you? So I don't know, I don't know how you deal with that. The, uh, there's been proposals for years to split the Ninth Circuit, which is, you know, it's is California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, Arizona, Nevada, and Montana. And, and they're right. And so the, the thought is, you know, do you split California in half? Who knows? But I'll let somebody out. That's above my pay grade. I'll let them figure that out. But no, there are other circuits where it's usually just a personality problem. And it just develops into this, this side and that side, and if you're in the middle, neither side likes you, and who knows. But most circuits, people try to get along. Because, as Brennan said, i got to work with that person. I may not agree with him, but i got to work with this person, and I may get that person with me on the next case, or they may get me with, with them on the next case. 
and that's critical. If you are going to just believe in your principles and do not veer from those principles, you're not going to get coalitions as often as you would like. Yes, sir. It means it, it can't be cited by a, our court as precedent. It can be cited by you for whatever persuasive purpose you wish to cite it for in, in a brief. It used to be that courts like ours would try to tell you you can't do that, and ultimately on a national level they said, no, no, if you've decided the case, even though you call it not precedent, you, you, the lawyer, can say, hey, Third Circuit, here's what you have done in a past case. Yes, you didn't make it precedential, but I like the reasoning or whatever. And part of that is the culture of the court. I have written opinions where I would cite a not precedential opinion, not necessarily for support, and I would get one of my co-panelists coming back at me saying, take it out. We don't do that. And I go... We, we don't do that for purposes of supporting a proposition, but I'm merely giving it here for the history or whatever it might be. But we're gradually changing a little bit, but slowly. How is it noted to be non-presidential? Is it stated on the face of the opinion? Yes, it is. And it will say at the bottom, this does not constitute a precedent of our court pursuant to it. Is that a comment? Yes. And the federal level, it's common. Now, on the. Used to have unpublished opinions. I don't know if they still do. And a lot of judgment orders. We used to do judgment orders until 1996, but you don't get credit for judgment orders as an opinion. And so the, the view was in 96, at least two reasons. One, you get credit for it, but even more important, if you win or you lose, wouldn't it be nice to get at least a short opinion as to why you won or why you lost? And so. Over a lot of opposition, this is before my time with the court, I came on in 2000, over, uh, let people know. And it got through and still there, and it's pretty solidly in place at this point. Thank goodness. But I'm, I'm not a fan of judgment orders at all. Gene. I would think so. I mean, I'll give you an example. There was a dissent I wrote a few years ago in a case called uh, In Ray Philadelphia Newspapers. It was a bankruptcy case. And the question was the text of the particular statute which said that you can do one, two, or three. Did it really mean that one is if you sell it with a lien attached, two is if you sell the property in a plan of reorganization, free of the lien, and three covers miscellaneous cases. And I had colleagues who thought, no, if it means one, two, or three, you could use three to supersede two. And I said, no, you can't do that. And that you, so I basically went through and said, the text can be read two ways. I'm not saying their way is implausible, because there was a Fifth Circuit decision that's, that had gone that way. But there's another way to read it. And the consequences were such that you were going to cause chaos in the bankruptcy system. And the structure, I use structure in the sense of there's a canon called Nocitur Associates. You know something by the company it keeps. So if you use in the bankruptcy context something that where it appears in X place and it's same words in Y, the next time you see it in Z, Y doesn't mean the same as X and Y. But, uh, and and I, I think I may have thrown in fairness, I'm not sure. Yeah, so the follow up question to that, though, uh, this is the accusation that gets held against the pluralism is uh, doesn't that put you in a vulnerable position where it may just be a handoff and about coming out the way you think it should come out? So this is the story that. If all these cases came out the way I think they should come out, my blink response, mm -hmm. I'm, I would get an F. It, 
depends on the case. Some cases the text really does prevail. Some cases it may be that you are looking to the structure of government state relations and some and that now you right and some you you really do need to look at the consequences. I mean, one of the things I learned very quickly early on, don't be over broad. Don't try to decide the case five years from now today because you're going to screw it up. Or at least I would screw it up. So, uh, and, and fairness gnaws that. I mean, I'll give you an example of fairness. I won't name the name of the person. But that we had two cases. Really tough colleagues of mine. I mean, one was considered very conservative, the other moderate to conservative. And there was a case in Pennsylvania where a malpractice at a clinic. And in Pennsylvania, you have this child that was injured, was four years old, I believe, and you could sue all the way up to 18, I believe, and maybe even longer. But in Pennsylvania, you have to have what they call a certificate of, I call it merit or something, where the, the, a doctor says this malpractice claim has some merit, and you have to file it within 24 months, normally, because that's the statute. But here, if it's a child, you can go longer. So the attorney gets up, and he says they filed, they filed it 27 months later. So they were three months outside the window because this clinic got some small portion of its funding from the federal government, and therefore you had, I think, the Federal Tort Claims Act, and you had this two-year statute of limitations, 24 months. And I, don't, I didn't think there was much you could do. And one of my colleagues came into the conference, and he goes, my brother and I used to do these kind of cases. And I'm sitting there listening to him, and I'm thinking, the attorney said at the end, he said, if some, look at me. I'm the one who screwed up here. I didn't see this in the fine print. I've done this for 22 years. I've never had this kind of situation. But it's not their fault. It's my fault. And so he goes back in and he said, uh, I'm thinking there, but for the grace of God, go I. And I said, I don't see how you can write this. He said, I think there's a way. I said, you sure about that? He says, yep. He did a masterful job. Another time, one of my colleagues it was a case where you had about 34 young children in a residential neighborhood, but they were psychologically challenged. And people didn't want them in the neighborhood. And the question is, what could you do to say, to bring in the, the, the government and you had a number of cases, and I'm thinking maybe you can go this way and possibility. But at the end, the attorney said, at the closing, he said, can I just say one thing to you before I sit down? This case is not going to the Supreme Court. This case stops here. You are the court of last, and his voice was quivering, you are the court of last resort for these 34 kids who don't have another chance other than you. And we got back in the conference, and the one judge said, I said, you know, I think maybe there's a way. She, she looked at me, and she goes, I know there's a way. Watch this. She did a masterful job. And it was, it was the fairness tugging at these two judges, who you might not, whom you might not other think uh, were of that ilk. It can work for a lot of cases in a lot of situations. Storm? Tom, when I was on the court, there was some question about the utility of the sense and, uh, or the utility of uh, seeking unanimity. And uh, David Steele was a uh, law school writer. David's a good friend of mine.
I think if you can get the culture of the court to revert to what John Marshall did in the beginning of the U.S. Supreme Court and speak with one voice, when you can get Earl Warren visiting Robert Jackson, visiting Felix Frankfurter, visiting Stanley Reed, and to say it's important that we're nine to zero with no concurrences and no dissents and Brown be Board of Education, isn't that so much better? Don't they understand so much more quickly and so, with so much greater understanding of why you got there than if you have this side and that side? And what you're doing is it looks like you've got everyone trying to pick that low-hanging fruit that supports his or her position. And it does, what does it say to the public? If we could get there, if that could be the culture of the court, as you know, it's not the culture of the Supreme Court today. And I think at times some of the chief justices have tried, but it's tough to do. And you look at some opinions like the Affordable Care Act, I guess it was 175 pages of, of opinions, and your, your head's spinning a bit. But I don't know how I'm gonna, I would change that particular culture. I would say that on our court, you dissent if you really believe that y you need to. You concur only if you believe you need to. One of the things we've done on our court is back in the, I don't know what your court did, Jack and Norm, on the, uh, on the uh, Delaware Supreme Court, but we've, the younger ones, we have tried to talk about cases beforehand, before oral argument. It used to be in the old guard, and I think Collins was this way, Collins Seitz. And I'm not going to discuss with anyone, and the U.S. Supreme Court reportedly does it. The clerks will talk. Isn't that right, Gene? But, but not the justices so much. Some, okay. But the, uh, I'm going to study it, I'm not going to try to be influenced by another. I went back on our court and I said, you know, on the Second Circuit, when you had the uh, Learned Hand and Gus Hand and Tom Swan, they would exchange pre oral argument memos. And the idea was, I don't want to be surprised, and if I've missed something, tell me now so we can discuss it and I can look into it rather than have it happen at oral argument because you have sprung this on counsel and also sprung it on me, and wouldn't it be better if we try to work this out ahead of time? And to me, that makes more sense because it can get you, I think, in most cases, more to a consensus than you would be had you gone in with a really straight, rigid view, and now you hear something different, and now you're sitting back going, I'm not budging, because it's human nature. So. If we could get to what you're, you're talking about, it, I think would be certainly better for the public. Jack?
and it, it may depend on the case. Of course, and it also depends on the way the case comes up. It depends on uh, the way the lawyers present it. But what I can say is that, at least from my trial judge days, and uh, I can't, you know, it's different when you're sitting on the appellate court, but I'm not sure it's that different. Uh, you know, the uh, tactic of any good litigator is to persuade the judge or the court that your client deserves it. One of the things also in terms of culture is if you do dissent, don't make it personal. I learned this the hard way. I had a the, uh, good friend of mine, uh, Len Garth, who, God rest his soul. But he and I were in a case where we were going back and forth, and one nasty jab led to another. Led, uh, I'm going to beat that one, and then he's going to. And I got a call from a friend of mine, uh, Rod McKelvey, who was then the district judge. And he picked up the phone, he goes, you're better than that. I go, what are you talking about, Rod? You're better than that. That opinion is not, not you, it's not your personality. You are better than that. Don't do that again. I listen. Good advice. Good the, uh, the case eventually settled, thank God. <laughs> Judge Joe Weiss used to say on our court from Pittsburgh that you write your opinion, I'll write mine. Just let it go. One last question. Yes, Larry. Last question. Sure. Something you said before indicates, not surprisingly, that sometimes you expect the case just not to go up any further beyond the circuit. Uh, other times, I take it that that's a possibility. Does that possibility affect the way you write an opinion, and if so, when, how, and why? It can. I've had one or a, a couple where you knew it was going up, and you believed that you had, you had analyzed it correctly, but you believed if you were to make a bet in Vegas, it was probably nine to one against you. And you just, you just do it. So look, what's the old saying that Robert Jackson wrote in a concurrence in Brown v. Allen in 53 is the Supreme Court doesn't get the final word because it's infallible. It's infallible because it gets the final word. So they do their job, I do mine. And but for the most part, yeah, you often do think, oh, the example I gave, I said to my colleague, I, actually the one where the uh, 27 months had been gone through before the certificate of merit had been filed by the, by the doctor. And I said, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't think this necessarily, we're going to get reversed on this one if we do that. And, and my colleague goes, no, nah, no, nah, we won't. I, I, I'll, I'll make it. He did, a, and as I said, did a masterful job. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a thought. It's usually in the back of your mind and, and not necessarily in the front. I don't, Gene, how, I mean, when you're writing something, you worry that the idiots on the Third Circuit will screw it up. Yeah. Uh, but we have to decide the case. Doesn't mean they're right. <laughs> yeah.